And we now come to the preaching of God's word. And as I said last time, it's going to be a little bit before we get into our exposition of Romans. And part of the reason for that is that there were two issues on my mind that I wanted to address. The one was addressed last time, and that was climate change. Today, I want to speak to an issue that touches ecclesiology. And the issue is this, should women teach women theology? Should women teach women theology? So why address this issue? Well, it seems to be dominating much of the online discourse at the moment. In fact, even as I was coming in this morning, I interacted with a couple who had said on the way in today, they were discussing this very issue. And here is some of what's being said online. That because women are easily deceived, they shouldn't teach other women theology. That women should only teach women that which pertains to biblical womanhood. That women teaching women theology is a slippery slope to them teaching men that it's one step removed from assuming the pulpit, and that women should receive their theological instruction from their husband and their pastors. And the implication is nearly exclusively. So to the question, should women teach women theology? Some would say no that women shouldn't teach women theology. And in the language of Titus 1.11, in some cases, this discussion is upsetting entire households, causing women to question both whether and what they can teach. And apparently, not here, but elsewhere, it's even brought a woman to question whether she can teach her children theology. And to sort of frame this discussion, we can illustrate it like this. On the one side, you have those who believe that women are permitted to teach men, who deny Paul's teaching in 1 Timothy 2.12, where he says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. And on the other, you have those who respond by saying, not only are women not permitted to teach men, but they aren't even permitted to teach women, but for a very limited scope. And then someone like me comes along and says, actually, you're both wrong. And the first calls us a purveyor of oppressive, toxic masculinity, and the second calls us a closet feminist, to which I respond, I've been called worse. And what I think we're seeing is an overreaction to feminism. There are some who are acting like feminism is new and novel, as though it's not been around for decades. And instead of letting the word of God shape their life, they're simply reacting against it and are defining their godliness by how anti-feminist they are. And ironically enough, Some of the loudest and most boisterous advocates of this anti-feminist agenda are actually women who seem to embody the very thing they're calling out. Newsflash, the driving force behind feminism is what? It's the curse. It's an internal thing. And so you can be entirely opposed to a feministic ideology all the while being a feminist at heart. And that's why you never want to develop theology in reaction to something. God's word is supremely sufficient all on its own. So we're going to answer the question, should women teach women theology? Should women teach women theology? But let me say this at the outset, just to kind of lay 
out my beliefs as preliminary matters. I believe that men and women are different by design. I believe that God has assigned roles and functions to them that are consistent with that design. I believe that the husband is the authoritative head of his wife and that the wife is to submit to the headship of her husband. I believe that the office and role of pastor, elder, overseer, shepherd, and leader is exclusively reserved for biblically qualified men. I believe that scripture forbids women from teaching men. And I believe that the pulpit preaching ministry of the word is the primary means of grace in the life of the church. And so with that, let's get into it. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you seven reasons why women should teach women theology. Then I'm going to fire off 10 reasons why you should have a biblically robust women's ministry. And then I'm going to give you five important considerations. Sound good? So seven reasons why women should teach women theology. But let's kind of up the ante a little bit. Let's go like this. Seven reasons why women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal. Now, why do I say a biblical ideal versus the biblical ideal? Because the biblical ideal almost expresses exclusivity. I'm saying this is one of the biblical ideals for women to grow in the word. It's a biblical ideal. Seven reasons why women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal. And the first reason is this. Because the nature of discipleship necessitates it. Because the nature of discipleship necessitates it. To be a disciple, by definition, is to be a learner. And to disciple, by definition, is to teach. And in discipleship, you're to teach what? The Word. And what's the Word? It's God's revelation. And what's that? It's theology, the study of God. And when it comes to discipling women, who should disciple them? And someone will say, the husband. What if she doesn't have a husband? That same person will say, then it should be her father. What if her father's not saved? Or what if she is married, but is either at the same level spiritually as her husband, or is actually further along. The fact of the matter is that Titus 2 authorizes women discipling women, and it's impossible to disciple without teaching theology. That's the first reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal, because the nature of discipleship necessitates it. Now, second, because Titus 2 necessitates it because Titus 2 necessitates it. Look at Titus 2 for a moment. We're going to read the first five verses. Titus 2, starting in verse 1. So Paul here is instructing Titus to instruct the congregation in these things. Paul says, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage young women to love their husbands to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Now, among those at the epicenter of this entire discussion 
there are at least two faulty approaches to this text. One is to assert that this text limits what a woman can teach to only that which pertains to biblical womanhood. And biblical womanhood is basically limited to being a homemaker. And so the extent of discipleship that this text sanctions is simply telling women to be good homemakers without getting into much in the way of theology. And that is a woefully insufficient reading of this text. But even if, for the sake of argument, we granted that limited view of biblical womanhood, it's not hard to demonstrate that you can't teach that without getting into the depths of theology. You say, how so? Well, have you ever noticed that many of Paul's epistles are split into two halves? First half dealing with doctrine and theology. Second half dealing with application. Take Ephesians, for example. The first three chapters are absolutely loaded with high and lofty theology. And then in chapter four, in verse one, Paul says, therefore, which is to say that on the basis of all that I've just said, quote, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And from there, he goes on to apply all that he said to really every aspect of our lives. And that includes that a woman should be subject to her husband as the, ch as the church is to Christ, Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, which actually comes on the heels of the command to be being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. And so, to teach a woman to be subject to her husband, you may not only need to get into the first three chapters of Ephesians, you better be able to teach what it means to be spirit-filled, and that is theology, and has implications for how a wife relates to her husband. And what does that mean? That means that no matter how you dice it, you're going to have to teach theology to fulfill Titus 2. The other faulty approach is to assert that women can teach the whole counsel of God, get into, getting into all matters of theology, so long as the application of that theology is tailored to biblical womanhood, which is really a distinction without a difference. Because biblical womanhood, rightly understood, pertains to what? Every aspect of a woman's life. Nothing is beyond the scope of biblical womanhood. You say, prove it. Okay. What's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, 30. And so... To fulfill biblical womanhood, you need to fulfill the greatest commandment, and that involves absolutely everything. Now, we haven't really gotten into the text just yet, so let me point out a couple of things. One, note that older women are to teach what is good. Titus 2 and verse 3 Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. A single Greek word. And so in a single Greek word, you have both the activity and the content. Older women are to teach what is good. So what does that which is good consist of? Well, God is the fountain of all goodness. So it surely includes teaching about God, that's theology proper. And that which is good is certainly that which is consistent with the teaching of Scripture. So it surely includes Scripture itself. And in reality, to simply fulfill the purpose clause as expressed in verse 4, the so that, you might actually need to teach the whole counsel of God that to teach all that's bound up in verses four and five could demand delving into every category of theology. And that's in spite of the fact that this list here isn't exhaustive. Paul's not limiting what women can teach. This is representative of what women ought to teach. 
And so that which is good is going to consist of whatever is necessary for a woman's spiritual growth and development, and any limitations that are placed on that are purely arbitrary. In fact, let's illustrate this. Notice the word pure in verse 5. And we could almost do this with every single one of these words that Paul uses. But look at the word pure. End of verse 3, it says they're teaching what is good so that they may encourage. That word there isn't merely encourage. It could be rendered instruct, as in the LSB. There's, this is instructional so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, verse 5, pure. The word pure there doesn't just involve theology proper, the purity of God. It involves sexual purity. So what do you do with a woman who's struggling with sexual sin? You need to teach her biblical anthropology. She needs to understand the nature of herself as a new creation in Christ. Romans 6 that she's died to sin. And because she's no longer under the power of sin, she has everything she needs in the spirit of God and the truth of God to resist temptation. So if you're going to be a woman and you're going to teach other women to be pure in faithfulness to Titus 2, you're going to have to get into biblical anthropology. You, you can't limit the, 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 the implications that are drawn from this portion of Scripture. And when you get into biblical anthropology, for example, that's theology that's not limited to women. That is theology that applies to every new creature in Christ Jesus, men and women alike. And those who are more spiritually mature need to be able to teach that to those who aren't. And so again, any limitations that are placed on what women can teach based on Titus 2, 3 through 5 are purely arbitrary. Titus 2 necessitates that women teach women theology and even indicates that it's in fact a biblical ideal. That's the second reason that women should teach women theology. The third reason is this. Because the ultimate goal for a woman's salvation is conformity to Christ. Because the ultimate goal for a woman's salvation is conformity to Christ. And for this, you're going to have to turn again to Romans 8, 29, and 30. And by now, I feel like I'm a broken record, but there seems to be an utter failure to grasp the ultimate goal of a woman's salvation. Because some seem to be saying that the goal of her salvation is something less than this, less than conformity to Christ. That the goal of her salvation is simply biblical womanhood as defined in a grossly limited way. No, the ultimate goal of a woman's salvation is nothing less than conformity into the image of Christ and everything in her life ought to be structured to that end. Look at Romans 8, 29 and following. For those whom he, referring to God, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That is the goal, purpose of redemption, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So a saved woman lives between justification and glorification, at which time she will finally be made perfect. And everything in this life is to be working toward her progress in sanctification, her spiritual growth. And the primary means of grace in the life of every woman is the word of God with biblical preaching being the crown jewel of that ministry. And one of the God-ordained avenues for women to be under the ministry of the word is that which takes place as women minister to women, coming under the godly influence of other women who can build them up in the Lord, speaking truth into their lives and even correcting and rebuking when necessary. And yet you have some saying, no, 
A woman can only be taught by a woman when it has a very narrow focus. Otherwise, she's usurping the role of the pastor or the husband. Or no, it, it must be informal. This, this must be one-on-one. This cannot take place in the context of a structured women's ministry. And the one is unbiblical and the other is, again, purely arbitrary and needlessly cuts a woman off from vital means of grace in her life. So that's the third reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal, because the ultimate goal for a woman's salvation is conformity to Christ. And you want as much feeding into that as possible, not less. Now, fourth, because pastoral ministry is about equipping the saints for the work of service. Because pastoral ministry is about equipping the saints for the work of service. And for this, as you can probably imagine, you've got to go to Ephesians 4. One of the goals of pastoral ministry is to equip the body to minister to each other. And that means that one of the marks of a healthy church is that it's doing that ministry. And as that takes place, it works toward the building up of the body of Christ. And equipping the body most certainly includes equipping the women. And as an aspect of that, it's equipping them to minister the word. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 11 and following. And he gave some, referring to Christ, as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, by the way, that includes women, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So do you see that? Through preaching, teaching, and leading, we as pastors equip you, the congregation, to do the work of service. And as you do that work, it works toward the building up of the body of Christ. And the work of service includes the ministry of the word. So this service isn't merely the meeting of practical needs. It also includes ministering the word to each other. And that's implied in verse 13, but will be made explicit in verse 15. But look at verse 13 in the meantime. It says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So equipping the saints for the work of service has implications for the sanctification of the entire body. This isn't just about our sanctification as individuals. It's about our sanctification corporately. And it's the word that's most critical to our corporate growth. And that implies that the work of service includes equipping the saints to minister the word. In fact, this comes out explicitly in the verses that follow. Look at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Verse 15, note this, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Who's that addressed to? Just the men? To the whole church. Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into Christ. Maybe just a comment about that. in what seems to be this sort of hyper-patriarchal movement, it's almost like the, the husband becomes like the sole spiritual influence of the wife apart from that which takes place in the pulpit. 
all of us need the body. We are, we are members of the body, every one of us, and we are dependent on one another. I need you, you need me, we need each other, every single one of us, to minister to each other and to build the body of Christ up to all maturity. And really, even as you think about verses 14 and 15, consider the picture that this paints. Our pulpit ministry is feeding into the life of the church. We are seeking to sow bountifully into the life of Grace Life Church. And as we do that, it both shapes and feeds every other ministry of the word. And so it feeds into our Bible studies. It feeds into our men's ministry. It feeds into our women's ministry. It feeds into our CNC ministry. It feeds into our youth ministry and even our children's ministry. And all of that is feeding into each and every household so that we can exponentially increase both the quantity and quality of the ministry of the word in the life of our church, all for the building up of the body of Christ. And that's aside from all kinds of organic opportunities for the word to be ministered to each other that are generated by those structured times. You, you want to sow bountifully into the church. Now I'll say this. If a church wants to do church life without some or all of those structured ministries, that's their business. But we're in a race. We are in a race to present every man, woman, and child complete in Christ. And I am willing to put our strategy for discipleship up against anyone's, and we can wait till the judgment seat of Christ to see who fares better in the end. Our job is to build up the body of Christ, to equip the saints for the work of service, and we are committed to doing that all the way until the Lord either calls us home or returns. Amen? Amen. And so that's the fourth reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal. Because pastoral ministry is about equipping the saints for the work of service. A service that includes the ministry of the word and a ministry of the word that includes women. Now the fifth reason. Because the Spirit gifts women to teach. Because the Spirit gifts women to teach. First of all, there is nothing in Scripture that would indicate that the Spirit doesn't impart the gift of teaching to women. Nothing. In fact, it's just the opposite. For example, we know from Titus 2 that women are to perform a teaching function toward other women in the church. And that strongly suggests that the Spirit of God equips women uniquely for that task. And we know from Acts 21.9 that Stephen, who was one of the seven marked out in Acts 6, had four daughters who were female prophets, prophetesses. You can look that up for yourself, Acts 21.9. So there's precedent for women being given the gift of prophecy. And we're able to identify particular women in the body of Christ who have been uniquely gifted for the task of teaching. And that's exactly how we assess a man's giftedness. We see him teach and can identify that the Spirit has uniquely gifted him to minister the Word. And spiritual gifts are given by the Spirit to the individual for the common good. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's for the common good of the body, the building up of the body of Christ. And so, if some women are spiritually gifted to teach, it's natural that they would have an outlet to do that. And when they teach, what are they going to teach? Theology. The Word. That's the sixth reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal because the Spirit gifts women to teach. Now, sixth, 
if you haven't been convinced as yet, this should do it. Because women need to biblically counsel one another. Because women need to biblically counsel one another. Turn to Romans 15, 14 for a minute. Romans 15, 14. Notice what Paul says here. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able also to admonish one another. Pop quiz. Are women included in the one another's? Or are they excluded? I mean, it's a shame that I even have to ask that question. And really, that's a study all on its own. How many of the one another's require that women teach women theology? There's a homework assignment for someone. You chase that down. Pastor Jake can work it into his Sunday school lessons. And yet, Romans 15, 14 is altogether sufficient. What's the one another that's addressed here? End of the verse. It's to admonish one another. What does it mean to admonish? It means, quote, to counsel about the avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct. To counsel about the avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct. It can also be rendered to warn or instruct. And it's the word that undergirds biblical counseling. You say, but isn't that reserved for pastors? No. This is a one another responsibility. The whole notion that the, the pastors would be the only ones doing biblical counseling is folly. And we would never survive. We need the congregation to be involved in biblical counseling. And Paul was convinced that the church at Rome was filled with all knowledge and able also to admonish each other. And that included the women. So pop quiz number two, can you provide biblical counsel without teaching theology? Can you counsel about the avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct without teaching theology? Of course not. And women have a responsibility so far as they're able to counsel other women. And just know this, we have female biblical counselors here at Grace Life Church, and we are developing biblical counselors, female biblical counselors here at Grace Life Church, and we need more female biblical counselors here at Grace Life Church. It's critical as part of equipping the saints for the work of service. And that's the sixth reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal because women need to biblically counsel one another. Now the seventh reason, because the husband isn't the spiritual mediator between God and his wife. Because the husband isn't the spiritual mediator between God and his wife. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, Ephesians 2.18, which refers to Jews and Gentiles, but most definitely includes female Jews and Gentiles. Our husbands, both responsible and accountable for the spiritual well-being of their wives, yes, but that doesn't mean that they have to do all of the discipling, nor does it mean that they need to function as their wife's spiritual filter. 
Why do I say that? Because there's a, a weird, controlling and oppressive, hyper patriarchal thing going on. And as you might expect, young men are eating it up where the husband becomes a kind of spiritual dictator controlling everything his wife reads and listens to. And really, I wonder if it isn't born out of a spiritual insecurity that he's concerned his wife might outpace him theologically or spiritually. But either way, it isn't biblical manhood and it isn't Christ-like. And in most cases, these husbands are giving their wife far too little credit. I know of one husband, for example, who was reading a book. This book was not having a positive effect on her life. It was generating contentious discussion between her and her husband. And at a particular point, when the husband had sufficient data, he said, you know, hon, I don't think this book is producing the spirit in your life. And that was that. She snapped out of it. No, it's not. Clearly, this book is not producing the spirit in my life. I know of another husband whose wife was listening to podcasts that were getting into eschatology. And so she began to ask questions about eschatology. And the husband thought to himself, you know, I could just start drilling holes in every single one of their assertions and arguments. But instead, let's just sit down and we'll do an extended Bible study in Scripture dealing with the theme of eschatology. And she was benefited by that. That's how you do it. That's how you exercise spiritual headship in a Christ-like manner. Is the husband responsible? Yes. Is he the wife's spiritual mediator? No. And that's the seventh reason that women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal. And so let me summarize them for a moment just to keep them fresh in your mind. Women should teach women theology as a biblical ideal because the nature of discipleship necessitates it. Titus 2 necessitates it because the ultimate goal of a woman's salvation is conformity to Christ because pastoral ministry is about equipping the saints for the work of service because the Spirit gives women to teach because women need to biblically counsel one another, and because the husband isn't the spiritual mediator between God and his wife. Now, do I believe that it's biblically imperative to have a structured women's ministry? No. So why have one? Well, let me give you 10 reasons to have a biblically robust women's ministry. And I'll just try and fire these off. One, because it employs an effective strategy for discipleship. Because it employs an effective strategy for discipleship. The Titus 2 ministry is to take place. We can see that in Scripture. So why not structure a ministry with that as its aim and goal and seek to be as effective as you possibly can in the utilization of that time. Along with involvement from the leadership, the pastors and elders. So it's an effective strategy for discipleship too, because it gets women in the word and the word into women. Because it gets women in the word and the word into women. The word of Christ is to dwell in us richly. And women, especially those who don't work and are working in the home, have lots of opportunity to get in the Word and for the Word to get into them. So why not structure a ministry that gets women into the Word? That's why our ministry is revolving around inductive Bible study, because it builds into our women the discipline of reading the Scriptures. And that lends itself to the third reason, because it models how to faithfully and fruitfully both study and apply God's Word. Because it models how to faithfully and fruitfully both study and apply God's Word. By having a ministry that is arranged around Bible inductive study, 
You are modeling for women on a very hands-on personal level how to translate their personal time in the word into effective and powerful application. And that works towards what? Their spiritual growth. Four, because it establishes strong and healthy relationships centered around the word. Because it establishes strong and healthy relationships centered around the word. Look, when you study the scriptures, you are fellowshipping biblically. And all meaningful fellowship should revolve around the word of God. I would say that's one of the reasons why our fellowship here at Grace Life Church is so healthy and strong, because there is a, a love for the word of God, and your relationships are, are built upon the word of God. And to have strong, healthy relationships with your women in the church is a good thing for the church. That's the fourth reason. Five, because it proactively addresses heart issues and is preventative for crisis counseling. Because it proactively addresses heart issues and is preventative for crisis counseling. The word of God is living and active. And so when you have women discipling women and dealing with the heart on a level that's difficult to do in the context of pulpit preaching, you have a great opportunity to proactively deal with heart issues and to prevent those heart issues from metastasizing into crisis counseling. And so it's proactive. Six, because it strengthens the homes that make up the church. Because it strengthens the homes that make up the church. Look, the stronger women are in the home, and I say women because you can have daughters that are also in the home that are in the, the ministry as well. The stronger, I'll say it this way, the wife is in the home, the stronger the home. You don't want to put any limits on her spiritual growth. You want her to be as much like Christ as she can possibly be this side of glorification. And that's going to benefit everyone, including the husband. And so it strengthens the homes that make up the church. Seven, because it gives elders a stronger pulse on the health of their women. Because it gives elders a stronger pulse on the health of their women. Because... Our wives are involved in the discipleship of the women of our church. We have a good pulse on the women of our church. And that's important because it's going to shape the application that comes from the word of God. It's going to give us a sense of what we might need to address in various teaching situations. And so it helps us to effectively shepherd the flock. Number eight, because it provides a regular outlet to address the myriad of issues being generated in our day. Because it provides a regular outlet to address the myriad of issues being generated in our day. But the pulpit cannot keep up with the pace that social media is creating all kinds of ridiculous issues. And so we have a, a ministry in place that is weekly and, and regularly occurring, that is able to deal with some of the real live moment by moment stuff that's happening online. And so we have a regular outlet to be able to address those issues as they arise. You know, this issue, for example, that I'm dealing with now has been around for months. And it's just difficult in the flow of exposition to pull the car over and deal with an issue like this. So you wait for a break after you've given it some thought and you address it. But in the meantime, our women are proactively dealing with it in the context of our women's ministry. And that benefits our women. Number nine, because it insulates women against negative influences. Because it insulates women against negative influences. You know, we read this morning... This in 2 Timothy 3, verse 6 and following, for among them there are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There was a time when you had to go door to door to do that. Now, all you got to do is be a podcaster and you can just enter into households all over the world and teach whatever it is that you want to teach. And I'm saying, not in my watch. 
We're going to be proactively shepherding our women so that we can actually insulate them against the negative influences that are coming from that sphere. 10. And this one's obvious because it contributes to the spiritual growth and development of our women. Because it contributes to the spiritual growth and development of our women. Pretty simple. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Ten reasons why you ought to have a biblically robust women's ministry. Now, let me give you five important considerations. And I know time is of the essence, but let me just sneak these in. One, a strong pulpit ministry is paramount. A strong pulpit ministry is paramount. You know, apparently there was a pastor online recently that said that he's never met a woman with sound theology. He's a pastor, so whose fault is that? When I preach the word, I am not preaching only to the men. I am preaching to the whole body of Christ. I want our women to be rock solid theologically, built up in the word of God able to dot their I's and cross their T's with the best of them. And so a strong pulpit ministry is important because if you've got a weak pulpit ministry and you've got a, a, a biblically robust women's ministry that's pouring into your women over time, that women's ministry is going to actually exceed. You're gonna, it's going to be feeding the women better than the pulpit. So pastors need to make sure they've got a strong pulpit ministry too. A women's ministry must be subject to the pulpit ministry. The pulpit ministry is primary. And so the women's ministry has to be subject to that pulpit ministry, supplementing it, complementing it, auxiliary to it. And so the women ought to be teaching that which is consistent with the doctrinal statement of the church, that which is consistent with the pulpit ministry. Three. You need to have biblically rock-solid discipleship leaders. Biblically rock-solid discipleship leaders are critical. In order to have a healthy, effective women's ministry, you got to have strong women. you got to have women that are able to do that work in ministry. they got to be women that the leadership can trust to do that ministry. That these are women that are going to have the best intentions of the church and the women in view. And so you've got to have biblically rock-solid discipleship leaders. Four, let me say this. Women shouldn't appoint themselves as teachers. Women should not appoint themselves as teachers. What's happening a lot right now is you've got women that are basically launching out into social media teaching ministries without any elder oversight. No, no appointing, no recognizing, no, no accountability to their leadership. Self-appointed female teachers, you shouldn't do that. If you're going to have a public ministry of any kind, it ought to be under the oversight of your elders. And five, timing is key. And I say this because there are churches that are at various points. And when we arrived at Grace Life Church, we weren't able to start a women's ministry right away. It took time. And so someone in some of the church that hears this sermon may be dissatisfied or discontent because their church doesn't have the kind of women's ministry that we had. And they need to be patient. Trust in the providence of God. All ministries are birthed from the word. And so as the pulpit is faithful, it's going to feed into the life of the church. And as it does that, ministries are going to come up and pop up and be developed and come to fruition. And so timing is key. Be patient. Serve your leadership. Love your leadership. Support your leadership. Five important considerations. And I'll just be honest. In preaching, one of the things you're supposed to do in the conclusion is land the plane effectively. Have a, a powerful, impactful conclusion. I don't have that today. <laughs> Maybe I'll say this. Be very wary of 
self-appointed online pastors who are seeking to make a name for themselves through podcast ministry. John MacArthur has said, and I think he's spot on, you take care of the depth of your ministry and God will take care of the breadth of it. And so a pastor needs to keep his head down, preach the word to his congregation, be faithful in that. And if God wants that man to have a ministry beyond the walls of his church, he'll providentially grant it. But men who go seeking after it, who seek to build their ministry on controversy, controversy that they end up coming out of the gates with storming, like a bull in a china shop, only to backpedal six or seven times by the time the whole controversy is done, where there's no controversy in the end anyway. Be wary of that. Don't be under their influence. You've got everything you need right here at Grace Life Church to be built up to all maturity. And that's not trusting in us. It's looking to Christ and his, his good will for the church, his revealed will for every single local church. And so women, be theologians, surpass your husbands in your understanding of theology, grow into the image of Christ, be as godly as you can possibly be. It'll glorify him. It'll bless your husband. It'll bless our church. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we are so thankful to be able to come together as a church, to fellowship under the word, to come before you in prayer and acknowledge your glory, grace, and goodness. Father, we're so thankful for this church, so thankful for the church of Christ, the revelation given to us in your word concerning the church and how we ought to conduct ourselves in the church. And so, Father, we give you great praise for this glorious institution that you have put in place that we call the church. In Jesus' name, amen.